things you should do when you pass these damn laws. Put a sunset provision in them. Review them in five years yeah. if you still want the law. Oh, man, that's a good one. Sunset clause. Sunset. Yes. Everything. Yes. Everything. So it's any law that's yeah. passed. Well, I'll give you a great example back to the spotted owl. Remember the spotted owl? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't want to debate the spotted owl. But I will say that Congress passed some uh, provisions, some money, to help the logging industry transition from the loss of business. Well, that was 15 plus years ago. Well, and it was designed for Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. Well, in the interim years, that program has grown in money, and there are 43 states that have been in that program. That is an excellent example of why there should be sunset laws. Oh my you know, there was a spotted owl in the barn, yeah. a young tree, a bush. You know. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I feel that a lot of our problems in the country and some of the social problems and different things come down to the disintegration of the, of the American family. That's true. Um, and I, you know, a lot of the decisions my wife and I make, we run it through what we call the family filter. All, how will this decision affect our family? Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to know how do you feel about the American family? It seems like the government wants to replace the family or they want to be, you know, they want to tell us you know, what to eat and how often to eat and what our kids can take in their lunch boxes or what life holds we can use and everything. You know, how would you feel about putting these decisions back to the responsibility of parents? Well, it gets back to my favorite, right? Every time the government tells you what to do, it's taking more control and, uh, and, and freedom. And I do believe in freedom. And this is well, a philosophical, and I'll bring it down a little bit more into your family ideas. Philosophically, I believe freedom is what makes our country great. It gives us those opportunities. It allows us to take advantage of those opportunities. And it gives us the best chance to be successful in whatever we want to be successful in. And I don't necessarily put a dollar amount next to success. That's right. You know, so um, that idea that you're talking about, not even a family filter yet, just that the government is trying to be your nanny state, or trying to tell you what to do, is not the way I want to run government be your, your representative. I think Michelle Obama is doing a great thing trying to raise awareness of LVE. But with our President Obama and the uh, current uh, Congress that takes every good idea and makes it a law, yeah. now you're like, like stop yeah. talking. You know, don't tell me what to do. I heard, I, at my last town hall, I heard a story about a mother that, that gave her kid organic food only, went to the store, extra money, believed that this was the best thing for her child, organic food only, and the school took the lunch away and gave them the processed food from the food line that was way worse for them in the interest of giving them a well-balanced diet. I mean, this is the grandma telling the story about her grandchild, but I mean, that is just absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely. So, Bring the Donald family filter. Now, growing up in a single mom family, uh, having uh, uh, different uh, families out there that I, in the military, I know broken families, whatever, my parents have been divorced and married three times. Oh, I have a family bush. I have a family tree. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a successful life or you know, be support or all that other stuff. So you have to recognize that uh, a one mom, one dad, and children is not necessarily the only way to go forward and be uh, have a fulfilled life. However, however, just what you said, the basic unit of society, governmental unit of society, is the family. And yes, statistically, now we're going left, I'm taking this out of the right brain side, and I'm going to take this over here in the left brain, you know, analytical side. Statistically, a father and a mother and children is the best chance for those children to succeed and for the wife or the woman to succeed and uh, for a, uh, the man, if you will, in the very traditional roles, uh, to succeed in his career. Absolutely. Be happy. When you take the father out of the way, those children are much more probably going to be on drugs, probably be in jail, probably going to fail in school. The wife is going to much, I, I can't 
can't remember the exact, the exact statistics, but I read a book about it. Uh, she is much more probably going to be living in poverty, you know, statistically, let alone all the devastation that I've lived through, let alone all of that. Statistically, it is proven out that when we diverge from the traditional family of a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, and children, it suffers. And now you take that into the second and third order consequences, and it just keeps hurting society as a whole. And yes, our country is weaker when our families are weaker. That doesn't mean we don't respect and honor, like my mom, who worked her tail off to do her best to raise us, myself and my, my sister. You, that doesn't take anything away from her. But I tell you what, as a man from that environment, I have done everything possible in my life, as well as my wife, to make sure that our husband, wife, father, mother, father, and kids have stayed together and have that family. So, absolutely. You can be pro-traditional family and still be compassionate to non-traditional families. They don't think so. You know, they, 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 they don't think so. Mother. They don't think twice the job. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I know. <laughs> yeah. now, now, here's the consequence. We blew up a walker. I went to Fresno State. Good school. Nothing wrong with Fresno State. I am the only child in my family that has gone to a four degree school. And the other, you know, my uncles and aunts and same My sister? My sister. Yeah, she's married to a welder. She stays at home. They're living in, I would say, probably upper, lower class. You know, he's got a job. They're not on a welfare. Uh, they're doing okay. But, uh, when did you leave Wisconsin and come here? When I was 17, I graduated high school. Came to Fresno to go to school for five years. And then five years in Texas and the rest of the time. Now, when were you in the military? I entered high school, I entered college, I turned 18 over the summer, went through ROTC at Fresno State. So I was commissioned at 21, just before I turned 22, so I was in the military. So I did have to wait 10 months to go to pod training, though. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, that's great, you're a lieutenant, uh, we're not going to pay you, don't starve to death, and come back in 10 months and we'll train you out by our <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we learned how to budget. We did learn how to yeah, budget we very well. Yeah, we learned $600 a month while well, she finished school and I worked landscaping. Uh, we did. Write a book, honey. We did. You know what? I did. I became an accredited financial counselor because there's nothing like knowing how to... Live on nothing. Right. We had 600 He made $600 a month landscaping and we, um, I, I could pay our rent. We, we drove only one car, and sometimes the gas ran out on Thursday before Friday's payday, so we rode our bikes to work or to school. But, um, we had yogurt every week. What? We had yogurt every week. And, and at the end of Sunday, here's, here, was our successful, here was our successful week. If we had $2 left at the end of um, on Sunday, we gave a dollar to church, and then we took the other dollar and went to Cassie's Yogurt, and had, we shared a $1 yogurt. <laughs> it was awesome. And, um, you know, those were good days, but we learned how to budget and we learned how, we learned what was important in life, you know. We didn't need to go to the movies. We had our friends over and, and hung out at the house with, um, you know, home pop popcorn. And, um, yeah, he still won't buy so okay, pop at the me. movie. Yes, we're wrapping up, but I'm going to, if there's a couple more good questions, I'll answer them. Uh, but we're going to wrap up here and I'll hang around a little bit longer. Yes, great. I did not hear your position on and border Ooh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why. Again, I'm going to give you real solutions, but guess what? I don't hear anybody talking about my solution. And it is what I consider common sense, conservative constitution. We have in this country 12 million plus or minus illegal immigrants. We have in this country states trying to do the job of the federal government and closing their borders because the federal government isn't doing their job. And you have the federal government taking those states to court to get them to stop without engaging and trying to make it happen. You have cities called sanctuary cities in this country that thumb their nose at the law and have no consequences, could care less, and allow illegal immigration with uh, no, no accountability. Our immigration policy is broken. Flat out broken. And it needs to be overhauled, reformed. If there are those that say amnesty, let them all in, let them be citizens, no limits. I don't agree with that. 
There are those that say, march them across the border at the end of a bayonet, and never let them in again. <laughs> no, I don't believe that. And they're a little bit further this way. Those that say, enforce the laws that are on the books. That is an easy answer to give with no hope of ever happening. And the, the, what I started with, uh, the, the illegals that are here, the sanctuary cities, all that stuff, is the evidence of that is just not going to be. So I have done a lot of thinking about this because I have direct exposure to it. And um, it started in 2003. If you remember what was going on in 2003, a lot of bullets flying, this is flying, and I was in a hotel in Kuwait. And I was reading in Kuwait how they have 800,000 nationals, Kuwaiti citizens, and two million guest workers. And I think if a country can do, you know, two and a half times their population, population and guest worker, there must be something going on there. So that was the start of my thought process on this. So I developed it a little farther. And there are still some details to be worked on. But it boils down to this. Three things. First thing, a guest worker program. Yeah. I have worked next to, I'll call them guest workers. They were probably illegal immigrants. I was a worker bee, so I don't know. They kicked my butt all day long when I was in college at the best, you know, height of my in shape athleticism. And we work 8, 10, 12 hours. I'm ready to go home and never come back again, and they're still working. And the next day, they come in fresh. And so, oh my God. I have talked to farmers. I have talked to business owners, the service industry, time and time again, I hear how we need the guest worker um, source of uh, uh, labor, that this economy, this the areas of our economy would flat out fail, and it's not that, uh, and it's not you can get American workers to fill in. I've heard that over and over again. I've heard it so much, I've seen it, I've lived in it, that I agree with it. There is a place in the American economy for a the guest worker population. However, we have this problem of illegal immigrants and, and the burden on society. So in this guest worker program, my first kind of plank of it is, is come on in. Get a guest worker ID, a biometric card that cannot be forged. So we know who you are as you go back and forth across the border. So if you're a bad person, we're not letting you in. But if you come here, you get a job, you take care of yourself, I don't care for your family, uh, you're taking care of yourself because you're employed. You'll pay a guest worker tax. It'll be something less than the American worker pays because you'll be, uh, well, let me get to that in a second. But the, the employer will make up the difference because there can be no competitive advantage of hiring a guest worker over an American worker. Okay? So they come in. They take care of themselves. With that, though, as a guest worker, you are not entitled, you will not receive any tax paid funded safety. Yes. No yes. social security, no unemployment, yes. no welfare, no disability. Yes. Yes. None of that. Yes. If you can't take care of yourself here, then go home right. and let your country take care of you. Because we can't afford it. Not that yes. I mean, let alone it's right or wrong. I don't think it's right. But we can't afford <laughs> to take care of you if you're not even a citizen. Go home, let that country take care of you. And that way, the economy will regulate the amount of guest workers in our system, uh, in, in, in America. So because they have jobs, the illegals, do well, they won't be elite. Because if no, they no, I'm saying, what about the illegals that are here? Are you saying that all the illegals will be guest workers? Yes, and they will have to go and get their guest worker ID. I don't need them to go across the border mm -hmm. to do it, because I think that's impractical. That is a difficult migration of people. It's just impractical. Although it might seem to be more, uh, have integrity with the law, it's just impractical to get all them to come and just come back. Because the idea is, is to allow them to come. It would be a transition period, give them, uh, I'm saying a year right now, that's going to be something that we need to work out. But a year to get your ID to where we start enforcing the law, and a year for those that are on government subsistence to come off. So we're going to take them off, and that's going to be controversial. But now, with that, reduce it by 10% of the month until the It's a good idea. Uh, but yeah, it's got to be done because we can't afford it. We cannot. And now, guest workers, it's win win. They get to come here because we're all sons and daughters of immigrants, unless you came here first. You know, immigration has made this country strong. It is the American dream, is what draws people here. It's a win for the guest worker because they get to participate in the greatest country in the world, the greatest standard of living, you know, the greatest economy. And the American economy benefits from a labor force that we need. 
but we don't lose in terms of all the tax dollars. Okay, first. Second, now you truly close the border. Now you really need to put up the fence, really need to, to patrol it, have the uh, motion sensors. Nobody gets crossed now because the only people coming across are the really bad guys, the terrorists, the criminals, the drug runners. Because if they were coming here for the American dream and had something to offer, they'd be going through the turnstile and getting their guest worker ID and coming in and going back and forth. So you truly have border security, a national defense, a national security issue. You truly can do that. And guess what? Now all those people that have argued against the fence as some sort of inhumane thing, what's your argument now? Again, going back to practicality and common sense, you just stripped away the other side's reason for fighting against it. Now, I'm all for the fence today. Put it up today without any guest worker program. Protect my border. But you have a segment in government that you have to fight, and here's how I'm, here's how I'm trying to solve problems to win. You know, I just took away every reason to put up the fence because I'm protecting America. Who's going to disagree with that? And That's my third plank. <laughs> you guys are good. I like Woodland. You guys are good. The third part of that is you have to close the anchor baby people. Because if you're going to treat U.S. citizens as special with that ability to tap into taxpayer safety net, that 14th Amendment and being born here as giving you citizenship was never designed for the French couple here on holiday yeah. that uh, had that she was six months pregnant and had their baby prematurely. Never for, designed for that child to be a U.S. citizen. Certainly was never designed for an illegal immigrant to come across, take advantage of our goodwill and compassion in an emergency room because we won't turn her away. And now that baby is born here and it's an American system. Well, you just get rid of the amendment. Well, you don't get rid of the amendment. You put it into the uh, bill. And if it's shut down by the, Constitu or by the Supreme Court, now I go for the, con the, uh, the constitutional amendment clarifying <coughs> that you need one U.S. citizen parent to be a U.S. citizen. Form, here or anywhere, if you have a U.S. citizen parent. So you put it in the bill. And it's again the practicality of trying to solve it because you have a lot of momentum against this, a lot of people. So put it in the bill, and now as we learn the benefits of the bill and people like what's going on, if it gets to the Supreme Court level and it's shut down for whatever reason, I read the 14th Amendment and I, I think it's improperly being used right now. But I'm not a Supreme Court justice. So if they should have done, now you have the momentum saying, look at the benefits of passing this and making it work. Now we need to go ahead and fight for the constitutional amendment. Because again, you're fighting inertia. You're trying to do things in a way, and this is my way of doing it. Uh, do things in a way that are going to be successful. Give yourself the best chance of being successful. Well, I'm sanctuary cities. So try to be the. Tax the money that they take to support all this, and uh, get them to stay there and services that they get. Yeah. Are my money gone? Yeah. They send the same. Yeah. It's all. Awesome. 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 That's what I mean. So I'm trying to solve this thing in a way that works. That is less government, right? There will be some government IDs and all that stuff. But uh, another thing that you can think about is 25 percent of your. California prison population, get back to releasing folks, are illegal immigrants. But you don't want to release, or you don't want to deport them because the poorest border will let those criminals back on your streets within the week. And so. We'd be better off to go and build a prison in Mexico, send them all there, and tell Mexico, those prisoners are accountable. At the end of the year, we will. Pay you X number of dollars for maintaining them. If they're not accountable in there, you won't get that money. Well, that's another good idea. You well, I like this idea. This idea. But, but if you truly secure your border, now you can deport them and let it be Mexico's problem or whatever country's problem, and, and it's not yours anymore, you know, because they can't come back. All right, I'll take a couple more and then we're going to wrap up. Yes. This is something that few people are talking about. But we have a demographic. Time bomb that's getting ready to go off. We have uh, uh, 300,000 people a month that are retiring, baby boom generation. So we need your gas worker program, uh, like we need our next spread to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the tax, you know, we're losing workers. My, if if what I talk about in terms of reducing taxation regulation and uh, 
litigation takes off the way I think it will, we're going to need we're going to need the import workers. I mean, we're going to have a vibrant economy with jobs everywhere as we are reducing the size of government and all those poor government workers losing their jobs. There's going to be jobs for them in the economy. There's going to be jobs. And so, yeah, we're going to need uh, Just But remember, my guest worker program, they do not pay a Social Security tax. Because they're not going to get Social Security. The immigrants, so one of the main concerns that I see is so frustrating because it taps into the health care is the huge losses in health care, the burden that is on the health care in California and Arizona, and how it raises the cost of everything because they often don't have to pay. They get receive yeah. free care. And that's one thing that kind of bugs me about this whole health care debate is, oh, if you're uninsured, then everybody else has got to pay for you. Why, if I'm unsure, do I think I can just go to the emergency room and get treated and walk away without a bill? I think hospitals should be able to refuse people. You can't pay your bill. Well, I, if you go to the grocery store or a restaurant, you can't pay your bill. You don't go in. Sure, I understand what you're saying, but I do support the idea of not turning away people if that are in need of emergency care. Now, we don't need to do physical therapy and all the other stuff, but emergency care, I do agree. However, you get a bill. You get a bill. responsibility for them, though. Right. You get a bill. And, and I don't care if it's $10 a month, you pay on that bill. So that's one thing I have a problem with this idea that if you're uninsured, that you don't have to pay your bill for if you need health care. Baloney, you do. And now, again, here's another intended consequence of my immigration policy is when you let people live in the light, when you let them be legal, now they can get a driver's license, guest worker driver's license, and car insurance with it. Now they can get health care, I guess we're going to get a health care you know, policy, and they can get health care because they're not living illegally and trying not to get caught. And now when uh, something happens, they go to the emergency room and don't tell them who they are, just you know, fix it. But what's your position on the language issue? Uh, I'll answer that quickly because it's easy. Anything government-wise, unless it's dealing with immigration, you know, specifically, needs to be English, whether it's a ballot or a bill or anything. Now, if United Airlines, my company, wants to say for Spanish, press two, they're trying to make money. If they think that that will help them make money, have at it. It's not my place to tell them. But the government, English, the official language, absolutely, this is America, we speak English. And if you're coming over here, learn language. You know, learn language. I go to countries all over the world. Would you put that in your I haven't considered it. For guest workers, they have to have a good knowledge of the English language. Yeah, I have. Both their children and their spouse. Yeah, I have considered requiring that as part of it. I wouldn't want to require it as part of it, but certainly we could put something like English needs to be the official language of uh, America in there. But why not? Because right now, our education system is being devastated because of our children's education being dumbed down because the illegal immigrants and that don't speak good English. Sure, and it would, it would concern me of how you enforce that. You know, you get into the practical side of it. What is a good working knowledge of English and how do you make that to play out? And if, if we are, from the government point of view, if we're leading by example and saying English is the official language of America and if you want to do business here, if you want to become a citizen and vote, you better know how to read because you're not putting the ballot in your language. If you are filling out forms or whatever, that we're encouraging that. My great-grandparents never learned English as far as I know from my 99-year-old grandma, but my grandma learned English and helped the parents and that worked. You know, that, that boiled down to where I can't speak hardly any other language other than that. I think I know how to say thank you in 23 languages because of my little house. Uh, but anyways, it, it, it's something very difficult to practically make happen and enforce. And so I'd be hesitant to say you need a good working knowledge or spruce to that effect. But we could make it an official language officially. But to be a citizen, sure, we could take the test of English to be a citizen. Let me, let me when you bring them in and their children, it's mandatory their kids have to go to school. <coughs> and you have the school system saying, oh, well, we can't segregate them and teach them English because it, you can't do that. Yeah, and if you have guests. 
Yeah. Now, that bad for the rest of the yeah. Well, now that's another uh, second order consequence is if you have guest worker or students, which I do think you should be able to let the students go to school because the <coughs> alternative is they run loose in the streets. The guest worker tax goes to the school system some of it to cover the cost. Uh, but yeah, you can now have guest worker children learning English mm -hmm. and separate them out. They're guest workers. And uh, you get to deal with some of that. I think that's an easy deal. You don't know how to speak English, you don't know how to speak English, and then they're free. You know, we can, we can make it happen. But let me answer this guy's question right here. Well, um, we got to finish. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll ask a different one now because Lenny Bones can beat you there. Um, <laughs> How would you handle, if you were elected to Congress, the, the situation that we're having now with North Korea mm -hmm. and possible situations down the road with Cuba and Venezuela and some of these other countries who are kind of nipping at us? Yeah, and with North Korea, and I'll define the issue and you tell me if you're looking for something else. North Korea is building nuclear weapons. That's the issue. They are building uh, rockets that can reach out and touch uh, much of Asia. And if they continue to develop their rockets the way they're developing, they'll be able to hit the Hawaii now, I mean, if this rocket is, is successful. And if they continue to develop their rockets, they'll have intercontinental ballistic missiles that will be able to reach the western United States. And they are a rogue nation, unaccountable, uncaring. And the previous guy that is now dead, thank God, uh, was nuts. And certainly, we don't want somebody that's nuts and charge of nuclear weapons. Now, the sun, I don't have a read on yet. I haven't had that intel yet. But, uh, yeah, it's a huge risk to have a uncivilized nation, or a nation that's not trying to play nice with the rest of the world, having that kind of power in Congress. That's really in the wheelhouse of the president. That is his as commander-in-chief, as president, as chief diplomat, all that stuff. He has to lead the way on that and make sure that he has as much leverage to keep that from happening as possible. My perspective from Congress is I really believe that in this 21st century, eventually one of these, these rogue nations, whether it's Iran or North Korea or somebody else that comes along, Venezuela, you know, that would be horrible. Uh, Cuba seems to be coming down, but it's another just flashpoint. One of these nations, if not an actual terrorist group, Hamas, Al Qaeda, you know, all these different things, eventually will get a nuclear weapon. And they will have designs to use it on us or Israel. And so we need to prepare. We need, this is an area where I'd spend money. National defense, and we'll prepare, I'd spend money. I believe in building up our missile defense systems, not tearing them down. Believe in putting them around our allies. When you talk about North Korea launching a missile on us, I have hauled some of these anti missile missiles in the back of my airplane. And North Korea launches one, we launch one, probably two or three to make sure we get it. Uh, they're bigger than Patriots. They are intercontinental anti missile missiles. So the Patriots are for tactical stuff around a base. This Patriot. Yeah, these things are North Korea, US, they're in the middle, and they fall. A really cool thing, I'll just take this time. I was flying my United airplane over Vandenberg, and I saw, they, they told us it was coming, I saw one of these missiles go up uh, and launch. That's one of the coolest things. This particular test failed, and they self-destructed it, and I saw it go up in a few seconds. But anyways, this anti-missile missiles and missile defense system, I really do believe is a 21st century thing that needs to be funded, and that's one thing I can do in Congress to make sure that I'm voting for that kind of stuff, and making the, the thing accountable, so we're spending the money wisely. Uh, another way of doing that is, I think, if we have a situation like Afghanistan back in 2001, we need to just go ahead and declare war and get it over. So you're bad. Do it. Go in. Right. right. If, if, if it is the decision, the best decision at the moment to deal with, whether it's a rogue nation or a rogue terrorist group, just follow the Constitution and declare the war. Make a goal. Do it and, and go for it. And that's another thing. Well, the Senate declared war, but I can be a part of the holy pulpit that would talk about it. So making sure that we are funding security initiatives that are dealing with 21st century threats is something I can do in Congress. At the diplomatic level, it is the State Department and the President that needs to lead the way. And that's why elections matter. <laughs>
So one last question, and then I'm going to wrap. Well, you have an ask one, so I'm going to let you go ahead. Oh, okay. You know what? Hey, Kid Kittles, can you start wrapping up and things so I can keep talking and we're closing down? This would probably be a good last question. Okay, you just, in Woodland, what do you mean besides money? Okay, well, let me. Because that's an obvious issue. Yeah, I'll get to that. And did you have another issue? Well, the, the, the thing I was going to say is I'm a big admirer of Paul Ryan, and I think that one of the, the advice he took and why he's so successful is that he really focused on one issue and so went in there and on. got on the committee and he's been, um, it's, so it's, it's like he's promoting it all the time. It's right. like he's running for office all the time. Not just with himself, but with his ideas. And, um, and so people follow him because his ideas are right there. I mean, he can do it, like you said, 2025, I'd be happy. But what is going to be your focus? I mean, because you're not going to be able to do everything. Yeah. What do you feel like you're, you're going to be on a committee or committees? What, what are you going to do? What is your main goal? Was it immigration? Or was it because you have a map? I mean, is it the budget committees or what? Absolutely. And, and I want this to be loud and clear that Rick Tubbs is your congressman, Congressman Rick Tubbs. The majority of my time, the, the singular focus I have, I mean, I have to have opinions and be able to do more than one thing. But the reason I am running for Congress, the reason I want to go there and deal with all the stuff I have to deal with, is to balance this stuff. That is why I want to do what I'm doing. And it is my hope and desire and my life dream that my children don't have to deal with my mess. That's right. And that's what I'm doing. So go ahead. So with that, so I really appreciate that. Um, so you had a different focus from Paul, and you said sooner. You wanted it sooner. Yeah. So I kind of read his um, his information. So is your information on your website, or like what kind of ideas could you make different? Yeah. And Paul Ryan's been doing this for almost 14 years now. Yeah. And that's his only job. Yeah. So he's a lot further along in his development of this concept than I am. Okay. But I will give you, some, first of all, the big picture, then some small picture, and then yes, I still have to fill in some, some blanks. But if I, we take our $3.6 trillion uh, budget, which is where it was, football wants to go north, take $3.6 trillion and set up that you're going to cut it by 3.5% gross cuts over five years, it comes down to $3 trillion. If you grow your $2.5 trillion in revenue by 4% a year, which I think will actually go up a lot higher than that, instituting some of the ideas I have uh, that we can work with in growing jobs. But let's just say, well, we're growing at 2.5% now with a terribly anemic uh, economy. So let's say we do some smart things now to grow, and it grows at 4%. In five years, you get the $3 trillion. That is my, my dot. If you will, that is my every day I cut together is three trillion. Right, three trillion as in five years. Now, the growth side of it is a lot of what I talked about tonight in, in releasing job creators. That's the growth side of it. That'll also help with the cuts uh, as you're not having to pay unemployment and all the different things that, that go along with unemployment. The, uh, the more cuts that we're talking about, and we're talking about $600 billion in cuts, which there is growth in other uh, entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, those things are growing. We can make cuts in that wisely. But we have to cut $600 billion from where we're at. There is estimated anywhere from you know, a, a $16 billion to $200 billion in fraud and waste of Medicare. I'm going to say there's about a $100 billion. That's what I'm going to be looking for. That's 100 of the 600 I need to get to. There is approximately about $98 billion in just spending mismanagement, meaning the government is spending more than they should because they're not accountable in their bills. They are wasting by overspending on bills to the tune of $98 billion a year. Holy cow. Okay, so there, now we're at $200 billion. We spend about, and this is Heritage Foundation information, this is where I'm getting this from. Uh, I didn't do it. Yeah, I didn't do the, the, the pen thing out. About $47 million in paying for federal workers that get a whole lot more in compensation. 
than if we were contracting it out. Now, I'm very careful about contracting out, especially in the military, because you want to make sure it's something that, uh, you know, if they go on strike, you're not shutting down the government. So you've got to be careful with it. But you can save money by paying for services much more cheaply. Heritage Foundation is $47 billion. About $25 billion is this pork, which we've done some work on that, which is bad spending. Now we're up to, uh, oh, and then one more $20 billion in, in facilities that we don't use. So you're at half my goal right there and just some big whacks. I've read a great book called National Suicide by uh, uh, Martin Gross. He estimates there's 500 to $700 billion of waste. Just waste. We're not even cutting any services to our people yet. And so, I mean, you're, you're well on your way to my $600 billion right there. I do believe, and I'm going to wrap up with this, and we'll all finish up with this question. But I do believe that the last great generation of this country is a World War II generation. They sacrificed to win that war, and we have been enjoying the blessings since. It is our time now. It is our time now to be the next great generation that makes the sacrifices so that our children and our grandchildren can live the American dream that we have. But we don't have to go to war and, and die and go through that pain. Our sacrifice is less dependence on the federal government. And it needs to be a national movement. I hope Paul Ryan's the vice president so we can talk about the Brick Tubbs budget instead of Paul Ryan. Budget. I wanted to say where he is. Yeah, well, that's the I say where he is. I wanted to 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 say where he is. In that budget, it'll be a national movement. I will fold a budget that has sacrifice everywhere and not serially, so it's all about who's the latest victim from the government. Throw a giant out the cliff. It'll be a national movement where it's what did, you know, we will wear this badge of honor. What did you give up so our kids could have And if we do it all together and we do it now, it won't be that much. But that's what I'm looking for. I just, I, I really believe now in this day and age with technology and all the, you know, Twitter right now doing and Facebook and stuff like that, that, you know, it takes, it takes the ideas that I think you have. You have the, the ideas. And then it takes um, this kind of personality that he has that really is able to promote it yep. to the general public that no congressman has ever done. You know, they just work, 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 work. They don't think about, you know, I have to promote this thing. And I just, you really have to do that. And whatever you do, you have to be able to promote it in a new level. Any congressman that goes out there has to, our, our conservative movement has to be promoted in a new level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why I want Paul Ryan there. Because yeah. he's promoting it at that level. I mean, in the vice president, I think he's wasted it. So, I told you I want to take over. I know. <laughs> I want to do it too. But I think you can do it too in yeah, the same thanks. way that he's doing that. And again, if you put it in the context of positive, right? Positive. What are we doing to make sure that they, I mean, what mom or dad or even somebody who thinks in that direction wouldn't give their life for their kids? Mm -hmm. All I'm asking is some reliance on the federal government. You know, and that's a positive national movement, you know, to do it together, the next great generation, so that our kids, our grandkids, look back to us and say, you did what needed to be done, so that I can live that America. That's the message I'll be able to make people feel proud. Okay, every, yes. Every progressive is a fiscal conservative with their own money. The problem is when they spend other people's money. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what I mean. It is your money, and I'm the steward of your money. That's how I see it. So to answer your question, wrap this up now, because it is getting late, and I really appreciate it. I mean, I'd go all night. i got to go work a lot, so I couldn't go that long. But anyways, I really appreciate the questions. You guys have been great. I love it. What you can do. If what you've heard tonight you like, if this is as you're walking out saying, yeah, I want Rick Tubbs to be my congressman. Thank you. I need you. I need, there's four things I need from you. First, I need your prayers. Absolutely. If you're a praying person, please pray for me and my family and what we're doing. That's the first thing. Next, I need your vote. I need it in June. I need it in November. That's the next thing I need. Third is volunteer. The way we do these town halls, <coughs> and it is the way we won the last primary and the way we're going to win it this time, <coughs> we go out and we deliver a few thousand flyers per town hall to doors. We make several hundred, maybe uh, a little over a thousand phone calls. And you don't knock on doors, you just deliver the flyer like you, some of you had it on your door. You don't have to discuss with the person on the phone. You're just offering a polite invite. And the whole idea is to have a positive experience on the phone, which is connected with my name. No discussion, no sales, no nothing. Just, hey, Rick Tubbs is having a town hall at Rio Vista, Veterans Memorial Hall. 
the 20, Friday, the 20th of April. And you'd like to come out, it's at 6 30. Go to the website if you can. Uh, so that's what I need help with. Um, uh, I do some emails to get uh, this as well. I need volunteers to do that kind of stuff for me because it takes about an hour to deliver 50 flyers and to deliver. The deliver at the housing mm -hmm. community list that we delivered 35 flyers for here. You can see how there's some real hours there that take up time. I work two jobs. My wife is still homeschooling one of her kids. We're giving up a lot, but we don't mind. The help we get, the volunteers are critical to the way we run the search. I don't need that. You're asking for volunteers to stay local. You can ask them to go to the district. Actually, if you can, yeah, come on and go wherever the town hall is. Like, uh, I had a bunch of people in Marysville, uh, Yuba County, do Marysville. They're going to help me with Yuba City. And if you, you want to stay closer, that's fine. Yuba City is the next week, and it's a little closer to where we're at here. So if you want to stay closer, but if you can come out to the district. But if you're doing phone calls, you can do them from your house. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have a phone bank down in uh, Fairfield. If you maybe can't do long distance from your house, but uh, yeah, it, phone calls are easy from your home. You don't necessarily have to go and do it. We do try to do it as a crowd. It's easier to do it as a crowd, but you can do it individually or take your husband and wife or a friend and do it. It's much easier with a driver and two people jumping out, but a driver and one person jumping out is, is good too. One person driving and walking is the least uh, effective, but you still get good exercise and deliver a lot of flyers. So volunteerism. Absolutely critical to what I'm doing. I, I don't need a lot of money to do what I'm doing to get the word out. If you do have some extra money and you can throw us $5, $2,500, somewhere in between, it does take some money to run the campaign. And uh, we've given all we've had and, and happy to do it. But it does take some money. So please, on your way out, or go to the website, drop off whatever you can. And that would be much appreciated. But I look at it in that, those priorities. We'll win this thing with your prayers, your votes, your volunteers, and, and uh, the money is helpful and necessary, but I'm not out there trying to raise $10 million in this race. So. Is that page that we signed coming in, is that for the volunteer? Yeah, make sure yes. the way to contact you. Okay. Email is probably the easiest, uh, but if there's a phone number or something, that'll work too. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody asked what he, how he's going to stay um, accountable to you guys or not turn into them and i will just give to all of you the same thing that i give to every town hall is that um you will have our address we do not live behind a gated community we um we live in a normal neighborhood and if he ever starts getting out of line come over come on friday night <laughs> uh, come for dinner just let me know because i'll be the first to you good cook? Yeah. <laughs> no but angela is and oh. <laughs> running for Congress and that whole running neighborhood thing. Yeah, yeah. Has, uh, by the time I get home, I just look in the fridge and go, really, I don't think I'm on the stuff. <laughs> no, Taco Bell. Yeah. We just sent our kids home to go find that. They were here for a minute and we said, yeah. go home and They stayed for longer than a minute. No, they were here for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I saw your kids. Um, we have Teens for Tubs. We have, uh, there's about, um, well, I think there's 72, 73 total, but, um, you know, consistently that come out, there's 21, 23 that come all the time. And then there's, you know, when we do fun, fun stuff, then they come out en masse, you know. And um, if we have a bounce house for some reason, every, every 14 to 24 year old comes out. Uh -huh. um,